Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwenza Garden in Ireland and in this video, the June Garden Tour, I'm going to be behind the camera. But don't worry, you don't get to look at me, but you get to look at a whole load of beautiful flowers because the garden is looking fantastic at the moment. I would say it is actually in full flower. So I guess without further ado, let's get on with the video. You are very welcome to the June garden tour of my garden Dwensa here in Southern Ireland. And if you're new to the channel, you should know that the garden is roughly an acre in size. That's half a hectare and it's located in what equates to as hardiness zone nine. Now in Ireland, we don't use that system, but just take that as a rough guide. All of the plants that you'll see today are left permanently in the ground, except of course for those in pots. That's the, <laughs> that's the key, I guess. That's the hint that these aren't ones that are completely hardy. I have lots to share with you today, lots of stuff in flower and some exciting new developments, namely the creation of a new bed, a new flower bed, a new lily bed. Wait till you see, it's gonna be great to share it with you. Also, I'm going to give some updates on previous projects. So my daylily bed, for example, how has that done? And the answer to that question is really, really quite spectacularly. But anyway, I jump ahead. Let's start off right here, right now, with the pot display in front of my front door. And you can see that I have several things in pots here, namely calla lilies or xantodesia. And my two stalwarts are the purple and white one named Picasso and the black one named Black Star. I also have a lot of lilies and it has just been thundering and bucketing down rain very recently. So two of these pots ended up on the ground and have been <laughs> hoisted back up with me. So you might see a couple of broken flowers, but these are all things that we gardeners need to deal with. And yeah, so on the right here, we have a fantastic pink, white and yellow lily called Beijing Moon. Fabulously fragrant, absolutely gorgeous. On the left, we have the tail end of the regal lilies, but also the beginning of the orange one called African Queen. And this is one that just landed on the floor very recently. <laughs> so you'll have to excuse her. And then right at the front, we have my Sobralia which is of course an orchid and a very large orchid that makes a super pot display. Poor old Sobralia mirabilis is looking a bit dog-eared at the moment because this was also one that I just picked up from lying on the ground. But it's a super orchid and it produces, like a day lily, flowers that last just one day or maybe a tiny bit longer. But there are lots coming. Now, this is an orchid that needs to be quite large before it gives you any kind of show. But at the moment, my goodness, what a show it is giving. And there are plenty more flowers to come. I guess you'll realize from this talk of thunder and rainstorms that the drought has ended. And yes, we are getting rain. We're getting lots of rain. It isn't enough to completely get rid of the brown that had come in the lawns, but it is certainly helpful for the plants. And well, yeah, now the problem is rain destroying flowers rather than drought just making them droop and die. Oh well, I guess there's always some gripe. Okay, well, you may have noticed that just beyond the lilies over there on the west side of the garden, we have my mock orange hedge in full flower. So maybe that's a great place to start our garden tour. I am, of course, a very big fan of mock orange. I mean, what's not to love? Beautifully scented bushes when they're in bloom. The only problem, I guess, is that they need pruning midsummer, which makes a bit of a mess. But 
over here in the west side of the garden they are certainly kind of livening things up if you sit out here the scent it's just intoxicating as you enter the west side of the garden what really draws the eye is the alstrom area and these are looking fantastic at the moment this variety is called selena and i absolutely love it really vigorous really floriferous and really really pretty you can see that the roses are just giving the last few of their flowers but it has been a long season for them and for that I'm very grateful. This one is Rosa Celeste, my favourite. Over here we've lots of nice leaf structure given by Regersia and Darmera. Just a little bit further over to the right, we have the newly planted up border that is supposed to strut its stuff in July, so we're not quite there yet. But what is looking really great at the moment is the diacea behind the Saracenia. So the Saracenia are those carnivorous plants, the insectivores, the yellow ones just in front, and the diacea is the pink one behind. Now this is a fantastic variety, Diacea personata, which is hardy for me in my zone and really, really tall. It needs staking and you can see here how I've not completely done that successfully because some strands are flopping about a bit. And just over here we have one of my fancy roscoas coming into flower and this one is just gorgeous with the big purple lip and white stripes on it i absolutely love it and just over to the right of it we have two more varieties one of which has beautiful red canes i think they both have beautiful red canes one more advanced than the other and all of course with a backdrop of scented mock orange. So we're gonna leave the West Garden through that little path there and head over to the main side. And here we have a quick pan of the three arches that lead into the main section of the garden. We have Hemericalis, Rocket City, that's the orange one there, and a fabulous Penstemon in full flower. And just to the left, we have an Anthemus. This has, of course, single flowers, which are very open and very inviting to all kinds of insects. And then moving to the bed further over to the right of it. And this has had a revamp whereby I took out the salvia that was in here, the blue salvia that just, well, anyway, got rid of it. And instead now we have red monarda and some annuals down below, some marigolds. This monarda is Cambridge Scarlet and it really is quite vigorous. I put it in several places in the garden this year, divided it and spread it around. And these little Tajitis marigolds were grown from seed, of course, and they just brighten things up a good bit. I see from the seed, um, which was open pollinated, that I seem to have two types in there. Through the middle arch, we can see the wheel border beckoning down there. But for the moment, we're just going to head on over to the left. And I guess I should give you an update on my box hedging. So you may recall I had box blight earlier on in the year, which I treated. And the good news is that these plants are regrowing and they're regrowing vigorously. They looked sad for quite a while, but you can see now that they really are trying to get on and overcome the blight. And hopefully, hopefully they will manage so here's a close-up of the worst affected area and you can see that even here there's new growth starting in on top when i cut them back first it was just stems and i thought oh my goodness can these plants ever recover but they do seem to be doing so now the crocosmia on the inside has a bad habit of flopping down over the box so i've just supported it with some hoops 
this year so that it just gives the box a chance because of course the kind of conditions that box blight love are ones where the plant is humid and wet and enclosed and yeah I'm trying to avoid that. So it's a funny story really because the circle we've just looked at and the cloud pruning area we looked at first were both affected by the box blight yet those little bushes down there in front of us weren't affected at all really strange i think it had something to do with the way the wind blows so lots of flowers and lots of color going on down here just beckoning us in and in front of us we have a mass of different colours, notably I suppose the Cambridge Scarlet Monarda and this is the original clump that was divided there to spread around the garden. And just over to the left we have many things including regal lilies and these ones are in full bloom whereas the ones in pots in front of the house are kind of going over now at this stage. And then I suppose if we move a little bit over to the left, we can see the extent of this border. And orange is the word here. Alstroemeria really steal the show from the dark leafed one to the right called Summer Skies to the bright orange one, which is interspersed in the border there called Oriana. And of course, we all love the odd rogue poppy that just pops up and does its stuff and very often just wrecks a colour scheme, but they're so welcome. And this is the shady end of that border. I love this part of the garden. It's just so colourful and so peaceful, but this isn't the best angle to view it from. And actually we're going to go over there this behind that lot of planting just to get the view that I like the most. But before we get to that view just another quick glance back at the Alstrom area. This one is Selena, the one we already saw over the West Garden. This is the original clump so it got divided and we're just going to go down there a bit to the right. Over here we have more Alstromeria and these are the Ligdu hybrids, a great one. And just a little bit higher than that we have the view out over the section we just came from and I do like looking at this part of the garden from this angle. I just, I think it's very good. The kind of the flowers melodian up and well that's something I really like. I already mentioned I know how much I love this part of the garden, how soothing and how calming it is with the dappled shade and the long shadows across the lawn, especially on a nice sunny day like this. Well, we had a lot of rain this morning, but it's now shaping up to be a fantastic day. And it's just, I don't know, I just look at it and it, it's how it makes me feel and that's what gardening is all about really isn't it and although I'd like to stay here the longest time and just look at the flowers and the play of shadows I think it's time to head up a bit further up the garden and oh yeah there's plenty of things to show you up there but here's a little shot for those gargoyle fans out there. Here's our Dr. Dracula looking broody as usual. But just before we head into the upper section there, the house section kind of like beside the house, a quick glance down at this planting here, which isn't usually featured. And we have on the right Ligularia, which was drooping like mad during the drought, but has now perked up. We have down there in front of us a hedge of Hypericum hidcoat, which is that gloriously yellow bush there. And it's planted on top of a bank, which is why it's so tall. To the left of it, we have the Sambucus, which is just finishing flowering. And yeah, 
but I just love the yellow of that Hypericum hid coat when it's in full flower. I think it makes a fantastic informal hedge. You never have to do much with it at all and you get flowers. What's not to love? And here we go through to the next section where we have Saracenia planters over there on the left. And you can just see how the Hypericum hedge back there poking between the trees kind of lines one side of the garden. And here we have the Saracenia planters surrounded mostly with Stipa tenuissima. If we swing down to the right, there's that Hypericum hedge again, looking gloriously yellow. And then just finishing off with Gilania, name going up on the screen, which is that white bush there, which is a mass of little tiny starry flowers at the moment, a great woodland plant. And the Gilania flanks a very shady walkway, which is this one here. Although it's less shady now since I lost a tree on the left, over the winter and that has just opened it up a bit and given more light and that leads us up here to the stone table and the circle of Alstroemeria. And you may recall how I planted this allium, the purple allium Christophii in among the Alstroemeria a while ago and it seems to have done rather well. So I was a bit nervous that the Alstroemeria would be too vigorous for the allium and kind of squeeze it out. But so far so good and I think they're looking quite well. <laughs> I love that splash of colour in here in an otherwise shady area. And you get an even bigger splash of colour if you look at it from this angle here. So you've got the Alstrom area and the Allium in the foreground. You've got a little kind of um, dwarf Japanese Acer over there on the left. Then you have a big splash of blue for the Hydrangea in the middle ground, all to a backdrop of Hypericum Hidcoat, which is a sunny yellow. And that leads on to my greenhouse area. So the glass house here in front of me is flanked by this border, which is, I suppose, a wash with the aconite, the monk's hood, which is that blue flower to the front. It's got Diacea personata, the tall pink in it, and also a lot of Alstroemeria. And there's been new planting too. So I got rid of a big clump of Watsonia that just looked tatty every which way. And also the Silphium at the back, the very tall yellow one that was impossible to stake. That went in spring. Now over here where we have the tree stump from the conifer that I got rid of, the Clematis, I have finally allowed it to start climbing up the central pole. The idea was to just fill in down below properly before I let it climb up because once the clematis goes up you can't get it to come down again. So it's filled in now and finally I'm going to let it climb up so hopefully by next year it will be filled in and we can stop looking at this ugly eyesore. In front of the glass house, we have my cornice, my wedding cake tree, flanked by a semicircular copper beech hedge, looking good. The glass house is here, also looking good, and I'm very pleased that I pruned the Daphne there to the right. I think it just, I mean, it looks more proportional now because the Daphne was really very tall before and kind of, well, it looked too big. I have some nice pots there in front of the greenhouse. The calla lilies, which I have so many of, are here again, but also a fantastic new lily. So this is Lilium nepalensa. And when I say it's a new lily, it is new for the garden, but it's not the first time I've grown it because this is a lily that's hard to keep in the ground. It's hard from the point of view that Although it's completely hardy, it is stoloniferous. So that means that it kind of wanders underneath the earth. So you never know quite where it's going to pop up. And that can be a bit of a problem if you're digging around. So I've lost it several times, 
but I think it is going to be an excellent candidate for a pot. Over here we have, well, a, a section of this border is newly planted and you can see how the farmer's hedge is encroaching at the edge and I really need to get some tall bush there at the back to cover that because it looks very weedy at the moment. And then there's my daylily bed, which is looking fantastic this year. So many blooms. Now, I guess it's kind of um, tailing off a little bit at this stage, but there are loads more to come. And that unnamed red daylily that I've had for years and that never did anything because it was in too much shade is now a wash with flowers. I'm absolutely delighted with how this has turned out. So, whereas before I was always dogged with the problem of daylilies never flowering because they were in shade or semi-shade or we didn't have enough sun. Well, now the problem is getting them all deadheaded because they produce so many flowers that go over so quickly that you just have to be completely on the ball, deadheading practically every day. And I suppose if you're going to have a problem, it's not the worst problem to have at all. Now at this stage, you're probably wondering about the new bed I said I planted up. Well, <clears throat> yes, we seem to have done the circle of the garden and I haven't yet shown it to you. And that's because this new bed, it's just there, just beyond the greenhouse. Now here I am pointing the camera at the greenhouse again and not showing you the new bed. And the reason for that is, well, okay, look, there's my Beijing moon, the big flower spike from the lilies at the front of the house that broke off. But the reason why I'm really pointing this camera at the greenhouse is because up until recently, the lilies that are now in this new flower bed were in here and they are the tiger lilies. Remember the dozens and dozens of tiger lilies that I propagated from bulbils just two years ago? Well, they now have a proper home. And here we are. Yes, this is my new flower bed to the north of the greenhouse. And this was a plastic strip on grass just this spring. I put the plastic down because I had in the back of my mind that I will eventually do something with this spot, but it was difficult to know what to do. Now, the advantage of this spot is that although it's the north face of the greenhouse, it does get full sun because the greenhouse is fairly transparent and there's a lot of ambient light as well. So it's a good spot. It has full sun, but it has very poor stony soil. So I wasn't looking forward to the job of actually planting here. Now I got the idea of a tiger lily wall from a visit to another garden last year where I saw an amazing, amazing planting of very tall orange tiger lilies. And I just thought, wow, I want to do that. I want to do that in my garden. And this is a good spot because it kind of, when the planting is tall at the side of this greenhouse, it will kind of cut off the view to the back of the garden, which is kind of the, the service area where the composts and things reside. So can you imagine here when these lilies grow tall, they're going to make a little alley between the hedge on the right and themselves on the left and just block off the look of the greenhouse and the view to the rest of the garden, making it a bit more enticing than the open view we have at the moment where we see the compost heaps just up there. Now, the planting of this flower bed was a first in many respects. It was a first because I didn't actually plant it myself. And I had two wonderful volunteers here just a little while ago, and they are Noelie and Canton from France. And they are the first people outside of my direct family who have ever planted something in the garden. And they planted up this lily bed for me great hard workers they were because this ground has lots of stones that had to be excavated before the lilies went in. So they dug the holes, they planted the lilies. After planting the lilies in the ground, they then put 
fertilizer all around them and we use sea leaves fertilizer which is a wonderful source very nutritious and i'm sure it's going to help these lilies grow strong and fast and floriferous the next step was to top the lot with a bit of compost and this is fruit farm compost so a local strawberry farm was giving away the grow bags that they had used to grow strawberries in last year and I took advantage brought a lot of them home and here is some of that compost going on top of the fertilizer to just help add a little boost to these poor lilies also given the fact that the soil underneath is so very poor the idea is to give them the best start possible so a great big thank you to Quentin and Noelie for planting up this bed and I do promise them to send photos when it has bulked up because I know that this is going to be a fantastic wonderful thing and look some of the lilies already have flower buds on. The idea with the mulch as well is to provide a hospitable place for the bulbils that these lilies so readily produce to fall down and immediately root and we have nearly come to the end of this June garden tour video but there is something I want to show you over the other side of the garden first just a quick look at this it's worth it and yes we're back here again but there is a little doubt right there in that raised bed that you just have to see so this is a succulent type plant perfectly hardy lives outdoors here and has spread around wantonly as you can see it's even in there in the cracks of the dry stone wall and it's well i mean it suggests spider in its name and i guess that's to do with the fact that the little rosettes seem to be covered in what looks like a spider's web but look look <laughs> it's in flower and aren't they the quirkiest little flowers you ever saw held on those tall succulent stems and those pink flowers there now it's not an amazing flowering considering how much of this plant i have but it's so unusual that i just love it and that brings me to the end of the June garden tour. I know we jumped about a bit there at the end, not a cohesive visit. You know, you'll have to come to one of my open days sometime to actually see a cohesive visit and walk around the garden yourself or better still, come with a group, bring your group. I'd love to hear from you. I open to groups by appointment. Thank you for watching this June garden tour. Thank you for liking, thank you for subscribing, and thank you for commenting. And I will see you on the next video. Bye.